Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Today on Sports Files, we examine the major issues with Memphis Tigers basketball, including the recent departure of star Austin Nichols. And we do so with three members of the Memphis media who are definitely in the know. Back in March, soon after a rare season in which the University of Memphis men's basketball team failed to play in the postseason, head coach Josh Pastner quickly turned his attention to the next season, the upcoming 2015-16 campaign. Oh, there were changes that would be made. Nick King decided to transfer and landed on his feet at Alabama, and Pookie Powell would also look for greener pastures at LaSalle. Pastner also made a change on his coaching staff, saying goodbye to Aki Collins and welcoming back Damon Stoudemire from Arizona. With a recruiting class bolstered by five-star forward Diedrich Lawson and the addition of talented guard Ricky Tarrant, a transfer from Alabama, the offseason was going quite well for Pastner and his program. But as fast as you could say, go Tigers go, the program was hit with a bombshell. Just a few weeks ago, the Tigers' top player from a season ago, Austin Nichols, a first-team all-league performer, abruptly decided to leave the program and transfer. The reasons why have been debated and will be again on today's program. But the bottom line is the Tigers' game plan for the upcoming season has been derailed. Now coach Josh Pastner, already on the proverbial hot seat, has been backed into a corner. Can the Tigers find a way without their best player? And can Josh Pastner win back the fans who have already jumped ship? Today we dive into all the pressing questions about Memphis Tigers basketball and do so with the Tigers beat writer from the Commercial Appeal, Jason Smith, Grant Milner from 24-7 Sports, and John Martin from 92.9 FM. And it's all next on Sports Files. Well, gentlemen, first of all, thanks for being with us. We don't usually do a show on the Memphis Tigers basketball team in the middle of summer. Right. Yep. But I thought this was appropriate. We have a lot going on. Obviously, what should be an uneventful summer, recruiting, things of that nature, became very eventful with the Austin Nichols news. So I want to get right into it. John, let me start with you. What happened? Well, with Austin, it was, uh, you know, the whole, the whole time everybody wanted one reason. They wanted there to be this, this boiling point, this breaking point. What led to Austin transferring? And uh, the simplest way to say it is that there were – it was a matrix in a way. You know, there's a lot of different factors in climbing. Right? You, you have the fact that when he committed to Memphis, number one, he didn't expect to be playing with an out-of-shape point guard who they got off the couch in year two. Uh, first year, he's playing with four guards, and that impacted things. Uh, number three, he didn't want to be a part of a, of a team that's going 18 and 14. Um, there's constant upheaval on the staff. There's turnover with the roster. Um, and I think all of those things sort of meshed and coalesced into a desire to transfer. Jason, he signed his scholarship for the upcoming season. This is just a few weeks before right. he decided he wanted to transfer that everything seemed hunky-dory. Everything right. was fine in Tigerland with Nichols. So it abruptly came to a point where he decided to leave. So while John is probably right with all these different reasons, mm -hmm. something had to make it come to a head at that point in time. Oh, there's no question. I mean, it, as far as we know, and at least from the Memphis side, Austin told them he was going to be back. He told them, you know, Josh had told him he's going to be team captain. He talked about being a top 25 team. So, you know, something went down basically, you know, in, in, in a, there in a two week period, something changed. I think he had told a lot of us uh, that he was going to be back. Um, and that's that, that's been the hardest part for Josh to get over is that, you know, you, you kind of had everything planned around this guy and he, and he in July tells you he's leaving. Now, you know, what was the tipping point? I don't, you, you know, John's got the three there. I think, I think the girlfriend certainly played a part. They're back together now, though, as far as I'm concerned. I think, I think it comes back down. It comes back down. It's got to, to, you know, you've got to have a, a, Josh gave Austin the keys to the palace last year. 
you've got to have a relationship with your best player to the point that at least he would feel like he's got to call you back or let you let you know what's going on. And the fact that obviously that relationship wasn't as strong as Josh thought, I think, yes, while it's a, it, it's a stab in the back, everyone can blame Austin. I think when you look on it now, you know, Josh has got to got to take some blame in this, and especially when you look at how many guys have transferred out. One reason I haven't heard yet is the, the father factor. Sure. Dad wanted him to go to Duke or anywhere but Memphis before he committed to Memphis. Now he wants them to transfer. I don't know how much a part that played in Grant, but as far as your investigation into this, what do you come up with as far as what do you think happened? Well, I'll say this first of all. I, I don't think there's any argument that he probably should have gone somewhere different out of college. I don't think anyone would, would dispute that. Um, out, of, out of high school? Yeah, out of high school, rather. Sorry. Um, I think his father wanted him to be somewhere else. He obviously had offers from, from big-name schools that he probably shouldn't have passed up on. And, and John mentioned a number of things, you know, playing with a, a point guard he didn't expect to be playing with, you know, dealing with a, a more guard-dominant lineup that first season, not really being the guy, even though he was thrusted right onto the scene at the beginning of the year and played a major role in their victory at the Old Spice Classic. But I don't know, I think the relationship certainly had a factor. I think that was kind of the tipping point that maybe his father used to uh, ultimately push him out the door and say, hey, look, this, it might be best to move on and, mm -hmm. and go do something else. But I, I, I do know for a fact that this was something he had mulled over for a while. Um, it's not like he just decided to do this two weeks from the, you know, from the start of the second uh, summer session. Um, but the timing of it was terrible. I don't think there's any other way to look at it. He, he shouldn't have backed out at the time that he did, and he handled it improperly. Not speaking to Josh Pastner after making that final decision, this was not very appropriate for a 20-year-old. I assume we're all in agreement that he should have faced Josh man-to-man -man and asked him about the transfer and told him the reasons why he should transfer. Does anybody think that this was the appropriate way to do it? Well, it depends on who you ask, because there was a meeting. Like, there was a meeting at the, at the Nichols family home. You know, and, and I, again, I don't know how official all of this was. I don't know if, you know, if Austin looked Josh Pastor in the eye and said, I want to transfer, and this is exactly why. But there was a meeting. So to say that there was no contact whatsoever, period, point blank, mm -hmm. that's a misnomer. That's not entirely true. Uh, but there, for, there was a stalemate, right? After the, there was never a formal meeting at Josh Pastner's office where Austin Nichols came in and sat down with Josh and say, Coach, I want to transfer. Here are the reasons why. Yes, in a perfect world, you'd prefer that happens. But let's be honest. Coaches leave all the time sure. um, and, and, and at inopportune times. And is, in some cases, they meet with their players. But in other cases, they do it via text message. I've, I've heard stories and read stories where Tommy Tuberville got up at a, at a recruiting dinner and just left and took another job. So um, we can say and we can preach and we can want to Austin to do this in, in person. Uh, but there was a meeting at the home. And uh, at the end of the day, if the kid wants to leave, he's made the decision already. And he doesn't necessarily owe any further explanation. There is a bit of a double standard between a player and, and, a, and a coach. But, Jason, um, as far as the meeting is concerned, I heard that as well. But I thought at that meeting it wasn't addressed. Definitely, I'm leaving. Right. So it was still up in the air whether or not this guy was coming back. That's when we wondered if he would actually talk to Josh. Mm -hmm. I think the coach deserved at least uh, in this instant – uh, his play, instance, his player coming up to him and asking. So I don't know if it was it was figured out at that meeting right. that he was 100% gone. Either way, when, when it's time to, when you've decided it, whatever, when it's time to ask for the release, mm -hmm. typically the way those things are done, the way it was done with Nick King, the way it was done with Pookie Powell, is you go into the coach's office and you talk to him, you tell him why you're leaving, and it's just kind of the professional way to handle things. I know we're talking about a 20-year-old kid, and John's right. He doesn't owe anyone any explanations, but there's a right, a right way to do things, and I just don't think he handled it the right way. Grant, what could the effect of a transfer of, of this nature, high-profile player, how much of an effect could it have on Josh Pastner moving forward recruiting other players? Well, you know, this offseason we saw Nick King leave, and that was really the first major player in the city that we saw decide to leave the University of Memphis after being here for a couple of years. And then you lose, you know, your marquee player, your, your top player, returning score in Austin Nichols and all of a sudden you probably have kids questioning in the 2016 class whether they should come here too is it going to work out for them for the longest time Josh Pastner was the golden boy and people thought 
I need to come here. I need to go play for him. This is a great spot. I've grown up here knowing about Memphis and you know, its illustrious history. And now I think there are question marks there. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what they do in this 2016 class and what his job status is moving forward. I think anything less than an NCAA tournament this following year, and he's out the door. All right, we'll get into that a little bit more later on in the program. Let me talk about uh, the recent a rash of transfers. This, this isn't just one guy. There's a lot of other other reasons that come into play, playing time, things of that nature. Uh, but is Josh completely to blame? And let me start with you, Jason. Or does some of this fall on the players themselves? Oh, there's no question that it, 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 it falls somewhere in the middle. It's not all on Josh. I know we want to pick one side and say it's it's you know a, a lot of the fans want to say this is Josh's fault. You look at the number seven transfers since since last August. Uh, and I think that's why when, when you add Nichols on top of it, that's when I say some of this has got to go on Josh. You're talking about relationships with players. You know, the knock on Josh early on from some of the national guys was he couldn't relate to the players, you know, that he coached, the inner city black kids that he coached. Well, here's a deal with a suburban white kid that he can't get to call him back either. So obviously there are relationship issues, mm -hmm. uh, so, something that he's got to get nailed down. So certainly he is deserving of some blame in this. But I agree. I think some – Look at Nick King's situation. You pull that one aside. The kid wanted to play the three. You know, Josh and those guys play him at the four. That's, you know, the dad wants him at the three. The, it, yes, it's individual with each one of them. And, yeah, you could, you could blame some of it on the players, a lot of it on the players. But it's got to all kind of boil back down to Josh. It's John, his program. John, is his ability to get the best recruits out the window? I think it's going to be a very, I don't want to say impossible climate, but I think this is probably the most tenuous climate he's ever faced in his time as a coach at any level, at Arizona, at Memphis. I mean, because you're talking about you're having to go on the road uh, basically the week after your best player, the face of your program, who Jason said, the one guy you're supposed to be able to reach uh, is leaving your program. I think it's a very tenuous climate right now for him to recruit. Um, and, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of stuff he's going to have to overcome with parents, with, with opponents opposing coaches negatively recruiting. Uh, I think it is as dicey in terms of the recruiting climate as it's ever been here at the University of Memphis. Grant, how do you win back the fans that have jumped ship other than just strictly winning? Is there something Josh Pastor can do? We know that he's going to go into a season now without Austin Nichols, so expectations won't be what they would have been with him. But fans right now, they're irate. They've uh, not renewed season tickets. It's not going well. They're coming off a disastrous year. How do you win them back? Well, I mean, you said it, you win. Uh, I think that's really the best way to do it. I don't think he needs to come out in this preseason and talk, you know, about expectations and talk about what this team could do, what right. they might do the scene. Just go out and do it. Uh, people are tired of hearing, you know, him say, you know, I don't know what we're going to have this year, or, or I think we should do this or that. That, that whole thing is out the window. It's time to just, you know, put, put the ball on the court and go beat somebody, and then people will start returning. I mean, you look historically – People in Memphis support a winner. They always have and they always will. And that's why you saw the numbers attendance-wise decline last year because people don't want to go watch a bad team play. That's just the reality. Not when you have a team like the Memphis Grizzlies that was as successful as it was a year ago. So I think first and foremost, he needs to win early and often this coming season. As I just mentioned, without Nichols, the expectations won't be as high. Probably a top 25 going in with Nichols. Now that the expectations aren't as high, uh, will people? I think I know the answer to this. Will people get off his back mm -hmm. if he gets to the NCAA tournament with the roster they have? It's still good players. You have the loss, but you have a lot of young players, a lot of unknown factors. But just getting to the tournament, do they leave him alone? I, no, I don't think they'll get off his back because Josh has kind of put all of his eggs into this Lawson basket. You went out and you hired Keelan Lawson. And, and you bring in Diedrich and KJ. Obviously, one is a McDonald's All-America, but when you put all your eggs in that basket, um, fans are going to expect to see those guys come in and play. Now, the unfortunate thing now for, for those guys is that the, the pressure is going to be more high on those guys. It's going to be more high on Diedrich Lawson, who probably now has to start at the four. And you didn't want that. You kind of wanted a situation when you had Austin that you could work Diedrich and KJ both in. Now they got to start off the back, and the pressure is going to be on. But no, fans are going to get off his back because he's kind of tied his wagon to the losses. John, we often hear about the criticism towards Josh and his staff for not developing players. Is that a fair criticism? I think certainly. I mean, listen, I mean, you're, the, his, his track record with – because a lot of times when you point to development, you're talking about the fringe guys, the Rodney Carneys of the world who come in unheralded, the CDRs of the world who come in unheralded, who you ultimately turn into prospects. I think Josh Pastner – he's got DJ Steffens, right? I think DJ Steffens is the one that you would sort of hold up right. in Will Barton. Outside of that – 
I think most guys have either performed right at or under uh, their recruiting ranking coming out of high school. And, I, and I, again, I, I think this is a tricky conversation because I do think some of the onus of development falls on the player himself. Sure. Because if a player doesn't want to get better, ultimately, if he doesn't want to wake up and go to the gym, if, if he doesn't want to stay at the gym and work out, like ultimately that kid's not going to develop. And Josh Pastner can't snap, or any coach can't snap his fingers and auto automatically make him an NBA prospect. Uh, but certainly, I mean, there are kids here who have come in through here who were regarded as NBA prospects who by the time they left – we're completely off the NBA's radar. Grant, do you agree with that? And if so, why do you think, what do you think the problem is that these players haven't developed? Well, I think it goes on, a, on both parties. You know, Josh probably hasn't reached his players as well as some other coaches do. I, I've said this before and I'll say it again. I, I think if you're the head coach of Memphis, development is probably one of the more key things because uh, if you look back on the history of Memphis basketball, outside of maybe the last year or two of the John Calipari era, you're not landed four or five star players all over the country. I mean, that just doesn't happen. Uh, you know, I, I think if you look at a, a place like Wichita State, Greg Marshall has done a great job of developing players because he knows he's not getting, you know, top 10 prospects every season. And I think for Josh, you know, he's got to figure out a way to reach his players and motivate them to become the players that, you know, they're rated as coming in. I don't think ratings are always fair, and I think some guys are probably uh, rated higher than they should have been coming out of high school. But, uh, you know, I think. It, it, you can't just say Josh is completely at fault here because players have to be in there. They have to put in time out of practice. There's 20 hours a week that you're allowed to have in the NCAA. And if you practice basketball 20 hours per week, you're probably not going to reach your potential. That's just the reality. So you look at guys like Joe Jackson and Jaron Johnson that spent the time in the gym. They got better during their time here. And I think it's because they, they put in more work on their own, not just when that final buzzer sounded at the end of the practice at the finish. As you all know, Josh is paid very handsomely, one of the top paid coaches in the country. Five years on that contract still remain upwards of about $10 million. So how, if he doesn't achieve the goals of not only making the NCAA tournament, but making noise in the tournament, how could they possibly let him go with that money owed to him? Are there enough boosters out there with deep pockets to make a change? John? I think they'll clearly have to come to you. I mean, that is, that, the, the only way that they will be able to come up with that money is if they come to Greg Gasson of Sports. Aside sports from my millions. Um, I, I think it will have to, because again, it is uh, $10 million we're talking about at least, right? If we, go, if we go through next season, we're talking about $10 million plus. And I think there has to be this level of, there has to be outrage. There has to be, to, for the, to fork over that kind of money, I think there has to be outrage from the boosters in some way. And, you know, I don't know what outrage looks like. Missing the NCAA tournament would probably make me very mad if I am, excuse that me. flies by <laughs> me. It would probably make me mad if I'm a booster and I'm investing all this money. So I think that's, that's where it comes. It's going to have to come from a place of, of real anger and real outrage and, you know, just a point of, or I'm not going to tolerate this anymore at the University of Memphis. That's what it's going to take. Jason, what will it take for Josh to not be in that situation where they're contemplating letting him go? I think if he makes the tournament and wins a game with his team, with, with his best player having left in July, I think he'll be okay. Um, I, I agree with John. I, I do think there's enough outrage right now that, I, you know, that if you sat Josh down just man to man and you talked to him, that, you know, that he would believe that another 18 and 14 and not making the tournament was going to get him fired uh, if that happens again. Right. But I think the concern is when you've got that much money uh, to spend to get him out of here to fire him, how much does that give you on the other side to hire your next coach if, if, if it indeed goes that way? Does that limit you on how high you can shoot for your next guy, or do you, would you have to take a second-tier guy because you're paying so much to, to get Josh out of here? Grant, would the fans be accepting of an NCAA tournament berth and one win? I think so. I don't see why you wouldn't be, given that you just lost your, your top player, and I know that's you know, your own fault, I guess. But, and you're coming off a disaster. Right, right? but you know, I, th I think – you got to be careful what you wish for because, mm -hmm. as has just been noted down this panel, um, the Mem Memphis doesn't exactly have millions of dollars to throw around at a head coach. Not only uh, have they milked a ton of their uh, donors and boosters on this, this capital campaign that they're still trying to put together, uh, but they're going to owe Josh a lot of money over the next four years, five years. Um, so I guess my thing is, like, if you hate having a coach that was inexperienced and uh, you, you want to hire somebody that is experienced, be careful about wanting to fire him because if they don't have the money, they're probably going to have to hire an assistant that is also an unproven head coach. 
I'm just not sure that's the right solution at this point when you have as much money on the table uh, as you do with Josh's contract. You led me perfectly into the next question. Damon Stoudemire is now part of the staff. People quickly said when Damon was rehired that Josh is basically hiring his heir apparent. Uh, John, if things don't go right for Josh, is Stoudemire the guy? For me, if I'm, at, if I'm a University of Memphis official and I'm trying to distance myself from the Josh Pashner era, I would not hire Damon Stoudemire. Because that, that would be my objective if I am the University of Memphis. I'm trying to distance you myself. You would break clean. Because he was a, he was a part of the, the majority of Josh Pashner's staff. He came back for a second state. He was a part of the first, uh, first few after the first couple of years at, at the University of Memphis. So I would try to distance myself from, just, be, just on principle, we just got rid of, of, of this guy uh, for all of the Brown, reasons that we've mentioned. Uh, if this, we're speaking hypothetically here. Uh, I would not try to go in that direction. Plus, you mentioned the fact that he'd be a first-time coach. And I know Damon's got NBA experience. I know he's well-liked around the country. I know he's got ties with Nike, all this. I just would, to me, to settle on Damon at the beginning, at the outset, it would feel like the, the University of Memphis didn't do their due diligence. I do think there would be some candidates across the country who would take a look at this job. I do think the Power Five non-affiliation hurts. But, you know, I, I personally would not go in that direction at the outset if, if the University of Memphis makes a change. All right, this one's for all three of you. What is Josh's greatest attribute and, and what is his biggest problem, his biggest issue in anything, not just I I coaching him as a person, him as a recruiter? Jason, where would you go with that? Wow. Well, his, his, I'd say his greatest attribute is just his honesty. Um, that's one thing that I think we, we've talked to his recruits, you talk mm -hmm. to the players on his team, he's honest with his guys. Um, the thing he's got to worry about right now is worrying so much about things that are out of control, worrying about what, what, what Grant Milner's writing, what Jason Smith's writing, what John Martin's saying on the radio, and letting that literally consume you to the point where I think it affects how good of a coach he can be. Worry about coaching your team. If, if Jeff Calkins said this after the season, Josh has to get more thick skin. We thought it would have happened by now after six years. Um, but I just think he's got to worry more about what he can control and not so much about what he can. All right, outside forces affecting him. Yeah. Grant? I, I think his greatest attribute is what he does off the basketball court. I mean, I think you look, not a single player has been arrested since he's been the head coach here. Sure. Um, you know, guys are making great grades. Uh, they've had a perfect APR score almost every single year he's been here. And the times that they haven't, it's been, you know, very close to the top. Um, but I think the thing that has that may ultimately cause his downfall is is almost this like rabbit ear nature. It's almost like a golfer on the range. When you hear one guy talking about something that's helped his swing, you automatically start doing it. And it's like that year that they decided they were going to press. He told me straight up, you know, I'm, I will not abandon this in game number two if we start getting scored on like crazy. And, he did. and what did they do? They abandoned it right away. It's right. like every right. year there is a change of what this team is about, you know. And, and you know, someone asked me recently, like, what, what would I say a Josh Pastner coach team looks like? And it's hard to answer that question because we've seen so many different things. And maybe it's too late at this point to say, you know, look, we're going to do this, and I don't care what happens. If we lose every single game, I'm going to stick with it, or if we win every single game. But I, I think that's been his, his biggest issue here is that he's gone in too many different directions. And for the guys that have carried over, which has been a lot of players from year to year, had not been a lot of one-and-done type of players at Memphis, I think they're confused, and you don't retain that level of success because of it. I think his I think his greatest attribute I think is is his character. I think I I think Josh Pastner is too good for this coaching business. I, mean, right. I really do. I think he is uh, seriously one of the most high integrity. He's principled, yeah. um, and, and he always tells you what he believes, and he he believes it. Um, if I'm talking about his his biggest issue. I do think it's his unwillingness to address his shortcomings as a coach. I think, and I, and I think we all can understand that on some level because he's a young guy, and I think he's he's reluctant to address those shortcomings because he wants to do it his way. He wants when he has success, he wants to he wants it to be the Josh Pastner way. He did it his way. I think that will be his stubbornness. I, I think he's just incredibly stubborn. He, he didn't hire the X and O assistant when he had a lot of people telling him to do that. He had right. an opportunity to address that this offseason. Sure. Instead, he hired somebody he was comfortable with in Damon Stoudemire. I think that is the thing. Don't be so afraid of change, uh, I, think he, I think his stubbornness will be uh, one of the points of the downfall. All right, final thing for you, got less than two minutes. What player will have the most pressure on him to perform and perform well for the Tigers to have success this upcoming season? 
Grant, let me start with you. I say it's Shaq Goodwin. You know, I mean, he's now the guy in the post, and you look at what they have surrounding him. Uh, a guy who doesn't turn 18 in Dedrick Lawson until October was supposed to be a senior in high school. Uh, and then Nick Marshall, a kid who just qualified. I think Shaq has to be like the Shaq Goodwin that led them to a victory at UConn last year, which seemed improbable uh, based on the fact that Austin was out of the lineup at that point. So I think it's there, there's going to be a lot of weight on his shoulders this season. He's got to step up. Jason? I think it's Ricky Tarrant, uh, the transfer from Alabama. Here's a guy, now that you've lost your number one scoring option in Austin Nichols, Here's a guy who can score 15, 16 points a game. You've basically got to cut him loose like a Will Barton, like a Joe Jackson, kind of let it – because what this team doesn't have uh, right now is that we haven't seen is proven scores. I think Terrence, that guy, he's got to, he's got to be big. John? I think it's Avery Woodson. I'm just kidding. It's not Avery Woodson. It's Deidre Glosson. Deidre Glosson is the McDonald's All-American. He's the five-star recruit, and he's going to be tasked with replacing the hole that is Austin Nichols. It will be Deidre Glosson. It will all be on his shoulders this year. Three different players. Let's see if they could all step up. Thanks for stepping up today on Sports Files. John, thank you so much. Yes, sir. Jason, always great to see you. Grant, welcome back. Thanks again for your input. Absolutely. And that'll do it for this week's program, folks. Remember to see any of our previous offerings. Simply head to our website, WKNO.org. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO.